Hi everybody, Adrian Fuentes is here. Did you know that the Democrats of Greater Tucson has a website, thedgt.org, and if you subscribe, it's only 20 bucks, you can support this great weekly communication where folks get together, sometimes there's candidates, sometimes folks like me pop on uh, to help understand what's going on in the world. The Democrats of Greater Tucson, thedgt.org, uh, join up today. Let's go ahead. Let's give a nice Democrats of Tucson, Demo, greater Democrats of Tucson, and our good friend, Mr. John. John, you uh, really appreciate you stepping up and being a candidate in, for state Senate in LD 17. Yeah. Hey, let's learn a little bit more about John. Absolutely. So some of you I've met, uh, I look forward to meeting more of you. Thank you very much for inviting me today. So I'll tell you, I'm sort of start, I'm going to start from um, sort of ground zero, even though some of you have heard this before. So my background is, um, was born in Phoenix, uh, went to schools in Phoenix, great public school education, came down to the University of Arizona, great education, got a degree in mathematics here, went off to California for graduate school, along with my future wife. And then we started our careers uh, in California. I've spent now 44 years in national security, um, mostly working for small companies, which I will tell you about, but 100% working primarily for the federal government and national security. So that's sort of my, my background. Um, so in California, when my wife and I started a family, we had a, a, a conversation about where we wanted to raise our children, basically. And there was, no hesitation whatsoever. We wanted to come back to Southern Arizona. Southern Arizona, Arizona is a great place, which you know, super place to raise a family, uh, affordable housing, at least at the time, um, great public schools for our children, uh, and really a great place um, uh, to expand our careers. And so we came back, actually 1990, I've been this, in this house uh, in the Tanca Verde Valley for 33 years now. Um, Continued in aerospace and defense here in Tucson, but I was approached by a professional colleague who asked if I would consider opening an office of his small company with the explicit purpose of getting into electro-optic sensor development. And if you know, if you follow technology in Tucson, Tucson, grounded by the Optical Sciences Center at the University of Arizona, is probably the, the premier place uh, in the country, if not the world, for doing electro-optic sensor development. So I accepted the challenge. Uh, we started with two people in a very, very small office in, I think it was 1992. Um, grew that company quite a bit. It's Arete Associates, A-R-E-T-E dot -E com. You can find them on the web and see what they do. But I grew the Tucson division. They've got a two-story office now at Swan and Camp Lowell. And we were very successful in electro-optic sensor development. Um, the business grew during my tenure there to about $30 million a year, and it's still thriving. They're probably doing $50 million a year now. So if you look at $30 million a year over 30 years, um, that's close to a billion dollars of economic activity that I was able to bring to Tucson. So a lot of good paying jobs, um, very low turnover. It's a very, very good company. One of my proudest, um, things I did when I was CEO of the entire company is I converted it from founder owned to employee owned. So Arate is now 100% employee owned, um, which really is a good benefit for the employees. Um, about 10 years ago, my wife uh, retired from Raytheon after 20 years of working at Raytheon. And I became very envious of her retirement lifestyle. So shortly thereafter, I, re I semi-retired. I still consult back to Arate, but I semi-retired from Arate, and, and the two of us turned our attention towards philanthropy and public service. So in my case, public service was in the form of uh, volunteering at various nonprofits. I'm actually currently on the board of new, two nonprofits here in Arizona. I'm the treasurer of Friends of Pima Animal Care Center, which is the large municipal animal shelter. I'm also uh, the secretary of Native Seed Search uh, that's been in Tucson for 40 years, basically saving arid adapted crops and now distributing those seeds so they can get back in cultivation. Uh, I spend probably 
oh, 15 hours a week down at the animal shelter working with dogs down there. I have, if anyone here on the call wants a dog, I'll, I'll help you find a good dog. I, I love doing animal welfare things. Um, but I would say about five years ago, I started following civic engagement beyond voting. And if you know that group, they're 100% focused on what's going on in the Arizona state legislature. And so I've been following them very, very closely, getting more and more concerned about what's happening up there uh, under Republican control of both the House and the Senate. And I'm seeing good, sensible bills put forward by Democratic senators and representatives that never get assigned to a hearing. So they never see the light of day. And sort of at the same time, seeing sort of ridiculous kind of bills, non-serious bills being promoted by you know, fringe elements in the Republican Party. And uh, you know, those get attention and everything else. Fortunately, fortunately, we have Katie Hobbs as governor that's uh, vetoing the worst of these bills. So she's saving us from a lot of bad stuff, but unfortunately the good stuff is not getting through. So last, I think it was last December, and I've been thinking about this for some time, but last December, I picked up the phone and called uh, Larry Wagoner over, who's head of LD17, and talked about the possibility of running two candidates for the two open house seats. Um, and he explained the strategy why it's more, pro it's a lower risk approach to run a single candidate, Kevin Bolt, uh, to make sure we flip one of those house seats. And so that was fine. I supported Kevin. I still support Kevin. We work very well together. But come January of this year, um, the Democratic candidate for the state Senate dropped out of the race. And so I had another conversation with Larry. We spent about a month, Larry, Bonnie Heidler, if you know her, uh, ADLCC, the Arizona Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee, uh, met with them. Uh, the Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee, which is a native uh, nationwide organization, vetted me. And after about a month, we decided that, first of all, we could not let Justine Wadsack go unchallenged. And they felt I'd be a compelling candidate in a district that's, by the way, a plurality of Republicans. Um, you know, the, the key to flipping the seat in the Senate is solid Democratic support, but attracting the independents and attracting the moderate Republicans, that's the path to victory. And so the feeling was like, because of my, my strong business background, that I'd make a compelling candidate. Um, so it's been just about a month. I mean, it really, the campaign is not that old. It's just a little bit over a month. We launched the campaign um, with an announcement of the LD17 monthly meeting. Um, Larry Bodine wrote a very, very nice blog for Arizona announcing the candidate. I got a very nice little uh, announcement that came out of the Tucson Sentinel. And I think the very next day, uh, the signatures on Equal just ramped up immediately. I mean, it was really, really a good boost to the campaign. And that's kept going. Um, I think it was it been maybe not quite two weeks ago we fulfilled the threshold on equal. So we passed the 533 uh, signature threshold on equal. Um, so we're gonna be on the ballot. We've collected lots more paper signatures, um, hundreds and hundreds, probably 500 other paper signatures. Tomorrow night, um, Kevin and I are getting together with our campaign manager to actually compile those paper, paper ballot or paper petitions and we're taking him up to the Secretary of State's office for this Thursday. So Kevin, I think, files at noon. I think I file at one o'clock. There's no doubt we have sufficient signatures. We will be on the ballot. Kevin and I are unchallenged in the primary, so we will be able to focus our 100% of our attention on taking on the Republican candidates. In my case, it'll be taking on, well, we, we believe it'll be Justine Wadsack, although she's being challenged by Vince Le Le uh, Leach in the primary. So we'll see how that all shakes out. Policy positions actually will be fairly familiar to you because they're similar in all with all the Democratic candidates, certainly women's reproductive rights. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But good public schools. I went to public schools. My children went to public schools. We have good public schools, but they need support at the state legislature right now. Clean water for Arizona, um, very, very serious issue right now. 
and some additional policies and so forth. And, and I welcome questions on any of my policy stances. One of the things I will point out with regard to these policies, uh, the Senator in LD18, Priya Zandarishan, introduced a very, very good bill on uh, that would protect our water supply. And it never even got a hearing. I mean, this is serious stuff and the Republican majority is, is stopping serious bills from ever getting heard. So if we flip one seat, and I mentioned this to Priya on Saturday, if we flip, flip one seat, we'll be able to reintroduce that bill this coming January and get that heard and hopefully get that passed. Um, Priya also had a very, very good bill on uh, contraceptive access. Now, first of all, I, I hope everybody's pushing hard to get the Arizona Abortion Access Act on our ballot. Uh, we're ga gathering lots of signatures. Um, but even if that passes, that only addresses abortion because an, uh, an initiative on the ballot can only be on one subject. So what's missing is protection and contraception access. So that's the bill she, she put forward. She engineered a very interesting parliamentary maneuver which forced Republicans to go on record being against this bill. Every single Republican Senator voted against contraceptive access. I mean, that's just unbelievable. Um, so they're giving us ammunition to challenge them in the general election. Um, I'm looking forward to that to that battle. Um, my attention will be sticking to these sensible policy positions that will appeal to independents and those moderate Republicans. Um, and I'm I'm feeling quite hopeful that we will have victory primarily because of the strength of the ground game in LD-17 and LD-18 and really the ground game of the Democrats throughout Arizona. So I'm feeling very good about that. The Democratic Democrats in Arizona are very well organized and that's gonna push me and push Kevin, push other candidates from the top to the bottom of the ballot uh, to victory come November. So that's sort of the brief introduction. I'm welcome, or, uh, welcome any questions, comments, discussion. That's that's what we're here for. Well, while you're formulating your question, let me just just echo uh, what Joe mentioned. I'm I've got I'm full on equal, so yeah, I don't think you'll even find my petition there anymore. But thank you for your support. People um, people signed up right away. But the Corporation Commission is extremely important. We have three good candidates for three open seats on the Corporation Commission. If you've not signed for those candidates, please do that. It is very, very important. Absolutely. And it just, if, if you have not gone on equal, I bet if you do, there still are other races yes. that you can also sign on uh, electronically. What, what's wonderful about it for the candidates, uh, the, the software basically verifies if all the information is correct. Mm -hmm. So, check it out it's a great way it could pave the way for easier uh nominations so and i think our candidates would would appreciate that okay yeah. we've got mike uh, brian has uh, a question or a chat room yeah. uh, i do actually excuse me this is my own question um when you meet uh an independent or a or a traditional conservative republican who's not so enchanted with the maga movement uh, what do you tell them uh, that Arizona should be doing and can be doing better in order to improve our economy, improve our environment for entrepreneurialism, and generally make the state a better place to, to live? Yeah, yeah, very good question. So I'm going to dance around the answer a little bit, but I will answer your question. Um, in, this, in, in looking at the Arizona abortion access uh, petitions, we can see course, strong Democratic support, but also strong independent support and actually strong Republican support. So there's a number of issues here that really are not partisan. So if it comes up in conversations, I'm not scared about talking about, you know, how myself personally and the Democratic you know, senators, House and Senate candidates in general support reproductive access to women. That, uh, that's supported by independents. Democrats and Republicans. When it comes to business and, and uh, sort of entrepreneurial things, my position, and it's why Arte Associates was very successful, is 
you need a very talented and well-educated workforce for business to want to come here and thrive. Um, here at Arite, we have the University of Arizona, but it also we also hire a lot of you know technicians, skill technicians, administrators, finance people, and everything else. Um, and without that spectrum of education that starts with good public schools, we would not survive as a business. For now, I was very familiar with Tucson because I went to the U of A, grew up down here, um, was very familiar with Tucson. But for a business from outside of the state, considering multiple places to come, whether it be Arizona, Texas, Utah, maybe someplace back east, what are they going to look like? They want a good quality of life for their employees. They want a good public education system for their employees. They want affordable housing. Unless you have that, no business is going to relocate to Arizona. So these issues of education, uh, affordable housing, um, you know, secure future and so forth, that's critical for business coming here, critical for uh, generating new jobs, critical for the economy. So I think the sort of the policy positions of the initiatives that we talk about are going to appeal to people like that. Does that make sense, Michael? Yeah, it absolutely does. So I do note a question in the in the chat here. Um, yes, I have an at blue link. I put in my uh, campaign website. It's just McLean for Arizona .com. There, that'll take you right to Act Blue. Yeah, and I also have position statements there and so forth. Um, I'm not seeing any additional questions in the chat at this moment, but I do have a, a kind of a follow up uh, ancillary question of my own, and that's uh, I heard with interest that you uh, that you converted Erte to a to employee owned business. Um, what lessons did you take from that that could be applied more generally uh, for business here in Arizona? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very good. Very, very good question. Um, Arate also always had a very, very strong culture. But when the founders were approaching retirement age, you know, word got around. And so we were approached by all from by all the aerospace companies, Raytheon, Northrop, Lockheed, Boeing, very interested in buying out. Uh, Arate Associates. And the employees came to Arate, a small company, because they liked working in that environment. And they were very, very concerned that being swallowed up by a large aerospace firm, as good as they are, it would really, uh, they'd really lose that culture. Mm -hmm. And so we actually rejected um, the appeals from, from the large aerospace companies and worked to go 100% uh, employee owned. Um, and if you look at sort of the lessons learned in employee-owned companies, they the have very low turnover. The employees are highly motivated to help the company succeed because they're shareholders in the company. Yeah. And if you look at the performance of, it's a privately held stock, but if you look at the performance of Arate stock compared to any one, one of these large aerospace companies, Arate has grown at a consistent rate much higher than the large aerospace companies. So this dynamic of, you know, employee ownership, where every employee has an ownership stake in the company, uh, drives a very, very strong culture with very, very low attrition. Uh, and so the company has just been wildly successful. Oh, by the way, you, you sort of asked, the, you asked the question, how does that apply perhaps then going to the legislature? Um, as the CEO of Arate through that time, Everyone in the company was an employee owner. Some had more ownership stake than others, but from entry-level employees up to the most senior professionals, I had to take input from everyone. And so it was sort of a learning curve, but we were always able to find a consensus that met, met sort of the concerns or addressed the concerns of every employee in the company. So that teach, teaches me compromise, consensus building, uh, you know, gathering support and so forth. Um, so going into the legislature, I'll be doing the same kind of thing. Believe it or not, you don't see any evidence of it here, but believe it or not, I do believe there's some moderate Republicans in both the House and Senate that would be amenable to that kind of compromise. Do you know anything by chance about our new Senate, state Senate candidate in one of your neighboring districts there, mm -hmm. 16? Yes. So Kevin, the House, uh, 
House candidate in LD17 and I are both very, very well set with regard to our petitions and so forth. We're in good shape. So Kevin and I uh, have been um, canvassing over an LD16 to help gather signatures. Um, in fact, our our campaign manager, Rodrigo Guerrero, uh, is now full-time over there for the next week anyway, up until April 1st, canvassing over there. So it's, uh, you know, pull out all the stops, let's go get signatures over there. We really want to, to run a candidate. I've met, met Stacy. she's a wonderful young woman, very, very dynamic, but it's a matter of feet on the ground gathering up the signatures right now. I I don't know where we are right now. There's, you know, almost a week to go. I guess not quite a week to go in gathering signatures. But LD6, if you think LD17 is gerrymandered, LD16 is even worse. It starts from Tucson, goes up through Pinal, ending up, I think, in southern um, southern Maricopa County. So, yeah, it's crazy. But there, everybody, everybody, I think, in ADLCC is up there right now gathering signatures. Great. Well, that... Thank you for sharing that. That that's really uh, warms my heart. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's see, Mike. Anything in the chat room? Uh, not thus far, Joe. But I do have another follow up for for John. If he's sure, sure, following. sure. Um, you know the the, the MAGA movement, uh, the the Trump movement, um, concerns a lot of uh, Repu traditional Republicans, just conservative Republicans who have traditional concerns about fiscal restraint. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, social conservatism, uh, you know, governmental conservatism, to not do too much, to not overstretch, to, to not be radical and activist. Mm -hmm. um, what do you tell people uh, who are of that mind uh, about this current MAGA movement and this current mo moment in politics to, to ensure them that there's a place for them here in the Democratic Party? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, it has to go back, well, for, again, I'm going to sort of, Come, come back to it from the side. Up until now, in terms of a gathering signatures for petitions, we've been knocking on Democrat doors. And so I have not had a lot of engagement with the independents, the moderate Republicans, or, or the MAGA Republicans. We, we will be knocking on the doors. We need to craft that message. But I'd go back, I'd go back to the statement, and I would engage in the dialogue with, with anyone, including the MAGA Republicans, um, to talk about policy issues. Um, I think when, when it comes to education, I would, I would ask the MAGA Republicans what their experience was in public schools. And I would think that the, the vast majority had a positive experience. And the question is, why wouldn't you want such a positive experience for your own children? Um, when it comes to schools, and I, don't, I do have the statistics, it's buried on my desk here somewhere, but the statistic is, Something over 90% of students in Arizona go to either public or uh, charter schools. And, and so if you talk to any parent, that's the default choice. And it's a very, very good choice. We have lots of A-rated schools. So if a MAGA Republican you know, challenges on the education front, I would point out what a quality uh, school system we have right now. Uh, when it comes to a secure water future, that's nonpartisan. Um, so I think if we talk about these major issues, um, we'll be able to hold our own. The other thing that's very, very important, and I'm coming up with a strong contrast now between myself and Justine Watson. And a perfect example of this, and probably the most egregious example of that, again, is in public schools. It was about a year ago, I think it was March of 2023, um, the schools hit this, this limit called the aggregate expenditure limit, if you remember all of that. A lot of wonky stuff here. But what it meant, if there was not an override of that expenditure limit, the schools would close in the middle of the school year. Um, I think all of the Democrats and, and many of the Republicans voted in favor of an override. Our schools stayed open. People made it through the end of the school year in 2023. But Justine Wags Wadsack voted no. So the consequence of, not, of her no vote would have been the schools would have closed in April. 800,000 students in Arizona would be thrown out of school. 800,000 families in Arizona would have to scramble to find alternative care or education. 
And that's sort of a lack of school that would be very, very difficult to recover from. She voted no on schools. I support schools. I mean, it's a pretty, pretty binary comparison. So we'll stick to the issues. Um, wonder if there's another another point I wanted to make. Yeah, there. I think I do think we have a question from uh, Barathan. Barathan, do you want to unmute yourself? And there Hello. you go. Um, I'd like to follow up on a point that uh, Mike was making. I think one of the things, and this is completely personal on my part, okay? I think that one of the reasons why Republican leadership in the House and the Senate takes the kind of crackpot positions they do is not because they don't understand the reality, but rather because they are very afraid. They're very afraid that the mother component in their constituencies will primary them out. They're also afraid, I think, of physical danger and risk like that. So when you talk about sticking to issues, how do you deal with the fear? Yeah, a oh, really good question. And I, I have to say, I don't have a really good answer for that one. But we will see how it plays out. Um, Justin Wadsack is being challenged by Vince Leach in the, in the Republican primary. And we'll just see see how the battle lines are drawn. Uh, I think that'll give us some indication. Well, it gives us some indication about, about how even the mega Republicans are going to be split between two extreme candidates. Um, but I absolutely take your point. Uh, you look in the legislature, a, a bill such as contraceptive access, why, why would any sensible person vote against that kind of access? Yet they they voted unanimously against it. So I, I think you're absolutely right. It's fear. Um, it makes me so I'm gonna I don't have a good answer for your question. It's a very, very good question. So what I'm gonna be going after is actually the moderate Republican voters. And I think then the people in the legislature, the Republicans that stay in the legislature, they will see, I'm hoping they will see that they're losing seats because of their, their blind obedience to this mega cult. And I think their opinions were changed once they start losing seats. And I, I hope to help them lose a seat. <laughs> Thanks for that. I don't know that anybody has an answer. For we, the question. we do too. We really <laughs> Thank do. You. Thank you. So Kathy, you have a question. So if you are up against Wadsack, um, she is known for offensive and very unacceptable commentary. And are you strong enough to handle that? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. In fact, no, I, no, this is, I'm very glad you brought that up because I've thought about this. Um, I'm not, uh, there's two, two answers. No, I'm, I'm going to ignore offensive, you know, commentary. I, I have to put a little bit of caveat on that. I don't know how fringe she's going to go, but. I will defend my family. If she starts insulting my wife or something, that's a different thing. Mm -hmm. I can take it myself. But the other thing I want to say is I don't want to, I don't want to, I do personally do not want to respond with equally offensive commentary about her. So I'm going to try to stick as much as I can above board on the issues. Let her, and I sincerely believe she will, let her self-destruct and alienate everybody with their negative commentary. I'm going to try to stick to the issues. Okay, so I have one more question. Or actually, it's a comment that is a segue from the other guy's comment about fear from MAGA. I think beyond the fear from MAGA or for MAGA is the fact that we have ALEC, and I'm assuming you know what ALEC is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that ALEC is feeding a lot of really crazy bills Mm -hmm. And of course, there's money behind that. And so people are sort of mindlessly moving on, just taking what they're given and moving forward with it. That's just a thought. Uh, yeah. And let me expand on that. I mean, one of my my big concerns, and I think it's a concern for, for everybody in this audience, certainly a concern for every candidate, is just the proliferation of fake news Yes. Um, and all of that. So you, you talk about Alec. Um, but it's really, that's just sort of a symptom of a bigger problem with all the fake news and everything else. That That is going to be a real, real challenge. So we need Thanks. to be armed with facts and use facts to counter the fake news. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you. Kathy. We're going to move on, see if we have any other questions. 
Any other questions? Okay, Andrea Kennedy has a question. What do you think of this financial business that's going on at the U of A? Do you have any thoughts on that? Besides oh, shaking your head going, how? Well, okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think, okay, so for this audience, first of all, first of all, my perspective is I've been a CEO of you know, $100 million company. Um, if I pull off a stunt like that, the board of directors would throw me out on the street immediately. So, so in the corporate world, in my corporate life, um, you know, the executives are accountable and the board of directors is, is accountable to the shareholders. And so when I look at the U of A without really having any inside information, I'm saying, where's the leadership? You know, the executive at the U of A, where's the board of regents, which is equivalent to the, you know, to a, a, a corporate board and so forth. I think there needs to be a lot of looking at what's going on um, for what it's worth. Um, I've got a lot of friends in, in the math department and they always describe how, you know, they, pro they provide a lot of, lot of math classes, required classes across the university, yet they get very little sort of income from tuition from the universities to support their program. So there's a lot of things going on at the university. I 100% support Katie Hobbs in demanding an outside external audit to really get to the bottom of this. By the way, the University of Arizona is a priceless asset for all of Arizona, priceless asset for Southern Arizona. We got to fix this problem. Okay, it's not a matter of punishing the U of A. We got to fix the problem. Okay, uh, Sue Anderson has her hand up. I wonder if your strategy changes at all if it turns out that Vince Leach is your opponent. Yeah. I. Well, you know, that's the short answer is yes. Uh, Vince Leash at least presents himself as a successful businessman. I don't know if he is or isn't. But um, if it is Vince Leach, I will out successful businessmen with Vince Leach. <laughs> you, know what, you know what I mean? I mean, I ran a business. I brought, like I say, a billion dollars of economic activity to Southern Arizona. Um, Vince Leach, uh, in fact, I've just been doing more research on Vince Leach. He had some pretty extreme positions when he was in the legislature. So just as I described with Justin Watsack, I'm gonna have a sim similar piece of paper which contrasts Vince Leach against my various positions. Haven't formulated that. Uh, I certainly will as we go through primary series, uh, mm -hmm. the primary uh, time with those two candidates. Thank you. Okay, Dee Matlin has a question. Yes, John, I'm so glad you're running. And if you need Oppo research on Vince Leach, I have a lot. I've been doing it for years. Excellent. And also need to know LD17 is the way it is because of Vince Leach. They redesigned yes. it just exactly for him. And then, dang, he lost. So yep. one moment of joy in a long season. <laughs> but I had, um, since you have friends at the University of Arizona, with, for the last seven years, I've worked with professors and people there with Uncoke My Campus as they established the Freedom Center. And if you read the materials mm. and everything coming out of the Freedom Center, mm. they have a real um, bent on making us all free uh, market capitalists and those kinds of things. And I'm just wondering if Robbins isn't part of that, because you're looking at mm. him cutting all sorts of liberal arts things. Yeah. So just making the U a research institute for business and that kind of thing. And yet, if you're focusing on business, how did you lose all this money? Yeah. So yeah. is he a Coke plant? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It, I am concerned about, you know, any university accepting, you know, all of this funding to establish an endowed share or endowed center and empty squat because you're going to be manipulated by whoever provided the funding. And I think Robin sort of fell down that rabbit hole, whether it was deliberate or or he was just ignorant of the strings associated with that money. I don't know. Um, but that's a real problem. I mean, another concern is Robin's passion for uh, the online school. That came with a lot of really negative baggage. Um, I think that was a huge mistake. 
sort of what I speculate on, and other people have, have speculated on this, he has ASU envy. He wants to have an online campus. He wants to do all of these other things. He wants to look just like Michael Crow. And I think, I think that's a mistake. Why do you want to envy ASU? Michael Crow is doing a great job up there, but the U of A is something else. Um, and he should focus on things that are of importance to the U of A. I, by the way, I did want to mention, because um, I talked a little bit about philanthropy, and it's something I'm really excited with the outcome. Um, my wife is, and I um, established four endowed scholarships over at the U of A. One is for first-generation college students. The second is for community uh, community college transfer students. The third is a multi-year scholarship for students majoring in math education that, that are committed to teaching in secondary schools. And the fourth we just set up is on system engineering. But what's interesting about that, those the three scholarships have been in place for, I think, over 10 years. And there's a very, very long uh, roster of students that have benefited from those scholarships. And I would just say it's very gratifying to see young people who otherwise don't have the economic capacity to go to university get a university education. It's a wonderful thing to do. So yeah, we've got a great, great university here. Let's keep it up. You know, thanks for sharing that, John. That that really is, uh, uh, we salute you for, for that work. That is really great. Uh, Barbara Warren, good to see you. You have a question? What are all the things that you would want to get engaged in making happen if you're elected uh, in our state to address the hotter, drier climate that we're facing and all the other issues that we're facing. What specifically do you think we need to be promoting or will you promote and support? Yeah, I, um, so there's it's such a broad, broad question. There's so many things that need to be, do, be done. I think water is a big issue. Um, Priya introduced a very good bill that never got a hearing, as I mentioned, and it really relates to um, how the state regulates water extraction on leased state land. So this is our land, right? And there, the current state land department lets uh, basically foreign companies pump as much water they, as they want without any controls whatsoever. We've got to fix the water. When it comes to climate, there's an awful lot that can be done and should be done to promote a transition from fossil fuels to green energy. Um, I've had solar panels on my roof probably 15 years now. I've got solar hot water on the roof. I do gray water harvesting. Um, I do rainwater harvesting. The interesting thing about every one of those things is each of them is an investment with a very, very short payback time. So you can argue on the economic side saying going to green energy is gonna save you uh, money in the long run. Um, I would love to see net metering come back for solar energy in Arizona. I'd love to see more financial incentives or bring back those financial incentives um, for a rooftop solar. Um, Joe mentioned it, I reinforced it. Um, getting Democrats on the Corporation Commission is so important. They regulate juice on electric power, salt river pro project, all these other things. I'm not sure about the salt river project, but they certainly regulate Tucson electric power and they've been backing off from uh, the timeline on reaching you know, net zero in electricity generation. And I think we've got to turn that around. And the, the, the Corporation Commission is described as a co-equal branch of government along with the legislature. So they really set the standards and the timelines for uh, retiring fossil fuels. So we got to get those Corporation Commission uh, Democrats elected this time around. That said, I think the state can do a lot with incentives for rooftop solar, um, uh, battery storage for homes. I think you need that just because solar obviously has a diurnal cycle on it, um, rainwater harvesting and all of these other things. The city of Tucson and Pima County in general is very, very progressive in terms of replacing city buses with electric buses, replacing school buses with electric buses, and so the state encouraging municipalities to accelerate that transition to electric transportation services will go a very long way. So there's actually a whole lot of things that can happen in the state legislature. I do have to say though, uh, we went from a $2 billion surplus in the state to a $700 million deficit in the state. 
So because of the flat tax and because of the vouchers, the state's gonna run out of money. So it, it's gonna be really challenging to put in those investments. And I use the word investment wisely because they'll eventually be paid back, but it'll be difficult to put in those investments if the Republicans are uh, bankrupting the state. Uh, two questions. One is uh, Rex Scott, our supervisor in your area, uh, was quite successful in winning in an area that we haven't won in in a long time. And you have uh, a number of uh, voter districts, precincts, which are in common with Rex's district. So I'm wondering whether uh, you and he have collaborated or in, in, in any way to uh, help the both of you, because Rex is up again. And the second question is, uh, how much emphasis do you think uh, will be put into uh, election denial uh, and the cost, the civic cost of needing protections at our elections boards, our county attorneys, uh, our county recorders, and even our school boards? Yeah, too, yeah, very, very good question. So, uh, so I'll tell you a little story about Rex Scott. And Rex Scott uh, and I, we, we have each other's number on speed dial. Uh, we will be collaborating quite a bit. We have jointly briefed, you know, various organizations in LD17. Um, but I got to tell you, the, the, one of the reasons why I'm running, and it's because of Rex Scott. So I mentioned at the outset, uh, I volunteered down at Pima Animal Care Center. I'm a very strong animal, uh, um, you know, animal advocate. And so uh, if you haven't followed the news, Pima Animal Care Center is just being swamped with dogs coming in. They just don't have the capacity. And one of the reasons all these dogs are coming in is because there are multiple um, companies now basically selling puppy mill dogs in, in Tucson. Uh, and so I went down in front of the Board of Supervisors last June, asking them to implement some regulations to control the sale of puppy mill dogs. Rex Scott and really the entire Board of Supervisors were extremely supportive. He called me up after the meeting, asked me to give my recommendations to Jan Lesher um, to see about implementing them. And the answer that came back is Tucson had ordinances restricting the sale of puppy mill dogs years ago, but it was preempted at the state level. And so yeah, of course. that was one of the triggers. It's like, if we're going to fix this problem in animal welfare, I have to take it out of the state. And when now you start looking at bill after bill after bill, the state, the legislature up in Maricopa County thinks they know better than the citizens of Pima County and our board of supervisors and our mayor, you know, the city council. And so there's a whole, whole rack of bills we want to address to take away the preemption of local control. So that's my story about Rex Scott. Uh, obviously, Rex likes the idea of having a legislator who wants to get rid of preemption so the board of supervisors can do their job. The issue is getting elected. And so I will be comparing notes with Rex, Rex Scott. Um, I'm sorry. With all of that, I forgot your second question. <laughs> election election denial. Oh, yes. Protecting election workers and school board members. Yeah, that's a really good one. Um, all I can say is thank God we have a Democratic Secretary of State. He's not going to put up with any BS. Pardon my pardon my English on that. The uh, the notion of protecting poll workers, um, you know, and local election officials. Uh, that is a concern. Uh, I hope the Secretary of State sends out guidance to you know every every municipality, um, every county recorder on how to deal with potential election interference. We have to protect the poll, the poll workers. My wife was a poll worker for many for a couple of cycles. I think it's a very rewarding experience for her. I want to make sure for every poll worker that comes out of this and all future elections, it's still a rewarding uh, experience. Um, I hope it comes down from the Secretary of State. I hope there's good guidance for every county recorder. And as citizens, we, if we see something we don't like, we've got to call it out right away and put a stop to it. I believe there's an article, I, I think it was in the last two days, I believe it was Politico, but uh, describing the enormous uh, security measures that are being taken 
I believe in connection with the Maricopa County election system, permanent fencing, netting over fencing so that they will uh, protect the workers from not having their uh, their faces seen when they arrive in a parking lot. Oh. Uh, and uh, my impression is that Senator Wadzak is one of those people who uh, do what she can, does what she can to uh, you know, to ignite fires and ignite yeah. danger in this type of situation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's going to be a you know very volatile election, and it's going to be driven you know at, by the presidential race. We've got people, one candidate talking about bloodbaths already, right? So we got to put those protections in place. I mean, it, you know, 10 years ago, I, w I couldn't fathom this kind of thing happening. Of course, January 6th happened. So, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's tough. It's crazy. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, we were very wise to uh, hire a Marine to be our Secretary of State. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to hire a Marine to be our next Senator from Arizona. So, uh, <laughs> Absolutely yeah. right. Absolutely right. That's right. I don't know if you've had the chance, but yeah, I, I think we all said it. we got to support good candidates from the top of the ticket to the bottom of the ticket. Uh, I had a chance to meet Ruben Gallego a couple of weeks ago at a fundraiser. What an incredible guy. I mean, we've he's perfect for Arizona. He's exactly what this state needs. So let's support yeah. him. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious now of uh, uh, John's campaign. LD seventeen. It, it, that's uh, where is where your headquarters is going to be, and what can we do to sign up to help LD seventeen? Because I'm in twenty, and we, um, I think we've got everything under control there. Is that right, Mike? Yeah. Say yes. And uh, and eighteen. Uh, that's that, that's those those are gimmies almost. So, um, yeah. what can we do to get seventeen? Can we help? you even though we aren't in your district to help on seven in your district for your race yeah yeah, yeah. a couple of things um there will be a lot of canvassing will be almost continuous uh you know all the way up to november um so so boots on the ground are helpful if you like to do that i understand at some point the campaign will be doing you know stuffing envelopes to get mailings out and so forth donations are are always important uh um uh, I'm sure you know, but Arizona is a swing state, and it's going to be Arizona's going to be attracting a lot of money from across the nation. Within Arizona, there are eight or nine competitive legislative districts, and so they will be getting the most of the attention from money within Arizona. Um, it's going to be a very expensive campaign. I forget who I was talking to the other day, but it was a candidate who ran you know, 10 years ago or something like that. And that that individual's campaign was, you know, at the six or $70,000 level. It's going to be almost 10 times that for a legislative seat this time around. So it's a big deal. By the way, we do not have any physical office at this point. There's talk about setting one up actually in Oro Valley because the LD is so geographically spread. Uh, and we'll let you know once we get that set up. Uh yeah, I was just wondering, you have worked with the university on projects with your company. <clears throat> and I mean, they seem to be very intent on working with different groups. They're all business related, but there's a lot of research in lunar and space. Uh, and other areas uh, that get lots of grant money. Um, can Robbins touch any of the grant money? No, that, and that's sort of what's beautiful about the grant money. Um, Arite has collaborated with U of A and um, uh, basically imaging for breast cancer, but using non-ionizing uh, radiation, getting away from x-rays. So we collaborate with the university on that. We've collaborated with the university on um, uh, biological agent detection. Um, so it's very robust, but that's all grant driven, mostly from the federal government and Robbins can't touch that. So no, I don't think any of the research projects are really in danger. Hey, thank you so much for the invitation. It's been a really- Oh, dynamic. John, thank yeah. you. Let's hear it for John. Yeah. Thank Marvelous you. meeting you, John. Thanks for joining us today. You've got a all good right. candidate, you. John. You're great, man. Yeah, All right. Thanks for the support. Take care. Yep. Okay.
Hey everybody, it's Senator Mark Kelly. As all of you know, Arizona Democrats have had a lot of important wins over the last few years. We won two U.S. Senate races and we delivered Arizona's electoral votes to President Biden and Vice President Harris. We elected Governor Katie Hobbs, Secretary of State Adrian Fontes, and Attorney General Chris Mays. Now, those elections were close, and our victories mattered. Arizona Democrats, from the federal to the local level, have delivered real results for our state on critical issues like combating climate change, lowering prescription drug costs, protecting the right to vote, and preventing more restrictions on abortion access. The Democrats of Greater Tucson offers the opportunity to hear from elected officials and candidates about that important work and the issues that matter to them. That information will be invaluable as Arizonans head to the polls. So this election cycle, whether you're signing up to knock doors, make phone calls, or joining the Democrats of Greater Tucson to hear from and speak to Democrats in our area, Please know that your voice matters and we need you on this team. Thank you.